Um, so mostly what I want you to take out of this is to have a vague idea of how this works so we can understand the flaws of deep learning and we can eventually get to the functional stuff. Um, so back propagation, you take your outputs, you compare them to some known outputs in the network, and you compare them, get the differences, and you generate what you call a cost to some function. Uh, you use that cost to attribute that using some fancy calculus uh, to get the errors of the outputs, and you use those errors in the same way to move them back to each layer until you get the error of basically every perception on the neuron network. Um, you use that, then use those errors to adjust the weights and biases. Um, for functional programmers, here is scholar code on how this applies. Can, um, can I just interrupt for one second? Sure. Since I think everyone in the room had taken a calculus one course. I don't want to use your talk. Oh, I'm not right. fancy calculus. This is very simple math. It's just the chain rule, and that's basically all. But the cost function is a function of all the inputs to the layers. And then you're just taking the gradient of that, and it's just the chain rule. There's nothing fancy about these networks. They're not new. They're. And they're in the 40s. Well, perceptrons are from the early 50s. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, so that's, so don't, don't let the hysteria uh, that part. You can learn everything there is to know about the math of these networks very fast if you don't already know. Absolutely. Um, and the math, even here, was very easy. This is how we go through a layer. So to run it, uh, I didn't just explain what Z was necessarily. That's just the state where you have all the weights and bias before you put in the estimation function. Um, you can input uh, get that by literally doing that zero and multiplying the input and the weight plus the bias. You can run that during activation function and you have the outputs. And for the big back propagation thing, it's literally you take an error back, you multiply it by a derivative, and then you transpose that and pass it back again. Oh, transpose the weights, multiply by that, pass it back again, and um, yeah, you attribute that to the weights and biases. Uh, does anyone have any questions about this code? What well, actually it does? Where is the activation function? Uh, that's going to be separately. Um, it's literally, if you look a couple slides back where I did the example there, it's that same activation function, just bring that up. I literally just took a screenshot of that up for that. Uh, if you want the straight math, um, I guess it kind of looks scary there, but Nancy said it's pretty easy to calculate. Uh, this is from a website that taught me most of what I have. Um, yeah. So we've, calculated, uh, we've gotten through and we've discussed how that gradient works. Hopefully everyone here kind of understands that you calculate from there and pass it back. You keep passing it back until things start to learn. Um, now we need to understand what deep learning is and the problem with that before we can talk about it for a functional perspective. Uh, and the big thing to understand about deep learning is that as you pass those gradients back, uh, Say all of your weights in your network are between zero and one. As they pass back, they get smaller. If you pass them again, they get exponentially smaller over and over again to the point where you really don't learn anything. Similarly, if your weights are over one, it keeps getting exponentially larger, and you learn a lot, and nothing really happens. And this is called the vanishing or the exploding gradient problem. And I know I'm getting the functional part too. <laughs> uh, so basically, what I just said. Um, about those exploding and vanishing gradients. Uh, deep learning is mostly a pile of hacks mathematically to lessen these problems so that we can get into deep networks and have them learn different traits and not have them learn incredibly, incredibly slowly. They still learn slower, but the progress we make it faster. And to go over a couple examples of these hacks, um, he was, oh, sorry, yeah? I have a question. When you talk about back, back propagating errors, are you currently back propagating them? Uh, yes, in a way. So you get the cost, you attribute the error based on that. Uh, of, you attribute the error of the output based on that. Then you recursively get to the layer before the output by basing it off of the output layer. And then okay. you go to the L minus one layer, L minus two layer, so on based off the layer. Okay. And then once you calculate cost with the new error, then you calculate cost again? Or? You're not actually you're not calculating cost. You're basing this off of the error of the previous layer. 
Oh, okay. Because, like, the cost is like the overall error of the network and everything else is like how each neural network is that attached. Okay. All right. Anything else? Why, why do you have exponential in there? Uh, because you, if you keep multiplying by like zero, uh, like zero by one, you're multiplying by further and further and deeper functions so it drops out faster. It's not like exactly exponentially, but basically. So the first hack we use to get around this, which is typically used for image processing, and I would hope there's a total idiot different than for this, um, is convolution, uh, where uh, assuming that everyone here knows what mathematical convolution is and you can't explain it in like imagey way, say you have a 2D like image. Uh, and you take a small square of those pixels, and you have a sliding window across, and each of those like sets of pixels, you attribute to the one around the envelope. Uh, from there, you can then continue to pull these in a way that, like, you can combine them and say, I want to only take the darkest pixel out of this. You can use that to like generalize area and with limited connection, so you're losing less error than waste. Uh, similar way, if you're trying to do recurrent uh, neural networks and do a sequential data, uh, there are these wonderful things called LSTMs, which use big magic with a neuron that basically determines what C preserve is looking to get at the beginning of the layer before it feeds everything in and return uh, back to itself. Uh, we'll talk about recurrent neural networks a little bit later, but first I might use the multiple layer. So, does anyone have any questions for there? What is LS, what does that stand for again? Long short term memory. Okay. It's kind of intentional today. <laughs> Go back a second. Yeah. What is NLP? Natural, natural language processing. Thank you. Yeah, that's one of the most common uses for uh, LSPN. If you want to like, analyze someone's tweet data, you can usually yeah, actually sure. right. Thank you. So, uh, to get onto it and get to why everyone's more here for the functional perspective. Conveniently, pure math and modular design for these layers works really, really well for functional programming. It's really easy to represent a pure math equation in a functional language. It's really, really easy to isolate things with moderate changes while using functional programming. And as we understand the network and as we understand like the hacks that we're doing to apply this, it gets easier and easier to understand this. Uh, so, to get a quick view, here's like a small subset of things that machine learning is good at. Here's a small set of things that functional programming is good at. And the overlap is enormous. Machine learning, and particularly neural networks, are very parallelizable. You have all those influential net neurons that, as long as you have the layer before it, you can calculate independently of each other. Uh, so, concurrency is a dream. And functional programming is so good at abstracting your functions into doing all these calculations separately. Uh, one program I just said earlier is really great at converting to a map. It's really good at building different modules for your network. And it's really good at big data. Scala is a very popular language for when you're trying to take a big data set and apply mass operations because things like fold and map and reduce are incredibly powerful for calculating big data, like various adjustments, abstractions, etc. Lazy evaluation, especially if you're doing fully connected networks, isn't a huge asset. So there are a few trade offs. Um, and machine learning is very, very good at making, good about maintaining your state, maintaining your weight of biases, and usually you want to avoid assignments. Machine learning is also CPU and actually really GPU intensive in most cases, which things like Scala or the JVM are really the best ones. But there's a lot of advantage in pure design of this, particularly if you're running the right structures. Do these, like Scholar or Haskell, have built in automatic differentiation? Uh, they do not have automatic differentiation that I'm aware of, but it is very, very easy just to write your app uh, formulas and plug from that. And I can, I have a slide for like extreme questions. But would they be yeah. good? Hmm? It is easy to express them. Would they be good for me? Um, That's the concern. That, that is a big issue, particularly if you're running on the JVM. Haskell has like C backend, if I'm not mistaken, in a way, that is very performant if you're implementing on it. Uh, Scala, less lightweight. Well, I guess I do worry about the GPU quite a bit, right? So to do anything with large data, 
St. Adams, you released her honors degree, right, or whatever degree, less than you know, five years ago. Yeah. Um, and so do you have something like a sentence and a half where everything is uh, permanent or something where there has to turn this? Like maybe there's no mention of like half by reference, so you have to do a copy of everything. Mm -hmm. Like fitting a large set of images or video onto the memory of a little bit is a challenge. So then fitting doubling that or doubling the weights in the network is, seems like it must be able to do everything you can with Haskell that you could do with sort of pure C or whatever. The big important thing that you need to think about here though is if you're doing you're not necessarily doing copying because of the lazy evaluation. You're performing the operations as your data set as you're continuing through it. So you don't actually have a full copy until you have the end results you're doing. Or at least what you really want to do. And you're also guaranteed that when you load in that data set, it's immutable. So if you need clear. to do, if you need to make a copy, you can't effectively point back to the original. You know, it's safe. But it's guess, immutable. Right, I guess I'm not so concerned about mutating, mutating the data, but mutating the network, right? So like, the net, network's large, right? These are Retina, whatever, G16. These have many, many, many hundreds of millions of parameters. Um, GPU memory is. Not particularly. Um, I am not going to advocate for the job of garbage collector. However, it does help clean that up decently as you're going through Scala and reassigning your values if you don't. Scala has the ability to do reassignment, unlike Haskell, but it does have also garbage collector if you are reassigning uh, or copying the values. Uh, Haskell, I think, has no way about the internals about how to handle this or anything else. Yes. But there's definitely that. Uh, you can get GPU information out. But the GPU itself doesn't know much about the GPU. You have to use special library. Yeah. yeah. Now, a counter argument to my original argument about <laughs> the opponent is I remember in 1991, I was having a discussion with some colleagues if C is performing because of its object oriented features. Yes. <laughs> If you do machine learning and say C++, you're going to be very sad. <laughs> what I'm saying is, now nobody talks about C++ is performance. You take it for granted. Yeah, it's less performant than C. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, C is less performant than assembly. And, you know. <laughs> what I'm saying is, maybe in two years, functional programming languages will be performant enough. Isn't 1991 around the time Haskell was first written by, uh, remember, at Yale? I'm not sure on that. But even if this isn't performance, it's probably more fun to learn in this way than trying to learn in C. The big thing is, I'm not going to argue that you should sit down and do all of your machine learning functional programming. And the big thing is, like, if you want to learn to do things and implement things for fun projects that aren't going to be like super performant on various things, it's a lot easier to write in functional programming and a lot easier to learn. Well, I would advocate. Because in like where you have to make you have to actually get your own stamp sometimes alone. That, that you should be advocating that deep learning is good. That fee is good for deep learning. But I don't, for, for the the key performance parts, they you know, this is like back propagating or large matrix multiplication basically. That that, that operation can be run on the GPU probably probably yeah. quickly. Um, and the rest of it could be run higher level. Yeah. Uh, the thing I want to bring that library in, right? So there's there are great libraries like you know, PyTorch and the Anima and TensorFlow that don't think functionally. There are GPU acceleration libraries that are written in Java and are being written functionally at the moment. The functional version is more alpha because they're trying to write a Um I talk about libraries a little bit closer to the end because that's more of a negative at the moment. And I gotta talk about first. Um, it's the benefits that's a great place. Um, One thing that I'm sorry, oh, on the subject of, of this anyway. One thing I I like the lake surf and Erlang by extension. And one of the, the guys, the Erlang guy said to me, everything is tagged by the editing. There's no tag by reference in Erlang. And I said, really? That must hit performance terribly. He said, well, no, it doesn't because when my, everything's a process in Erlang, a lightweight process, not like a, a, a 
and the whole app cracks up, or the whole bike that cracks. But when the cracks is done with the memory, you get rid of it. You don't have to worry about checking that somebody have a reference to what they left. I got my own copy. And the same thing holds true here. If you pass everything by value, when you're done, you get to do all the garbage collection management afterwards. You just cut them off, you know. So that would counterbalance and that would give you better performance in that kind of setting, in that kind of setting. And it's really easy to exaggerate like how big the floor shop is big in this. It's actually a lot of things. It's a lot of initial overhead, but once the process is running, it actually starts to be like some more fun that it is not like go below them, look how close. Well, I, 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 that, that's a given. I mean, I've had a piece of code that does video segmentation and it runs 300 stacks of like 12 hours on the and it says it's a little bit. So, yeah, that's a little bit. All right. Uh, any other questions for you, John? Um, so, as I said earlier, we want functional programming examples. This is just an example of how easy backtracking is, or how literally writing your own network is. Say so we have an abstract concept of aware that already has the fit function like I demonstrated earlier. To implement this in Scala or Haskell, it is literally two folds to be able to run a rail network. You run one fold, you push all the inputs on a stack, you run a fold back, pop them all off the stack, and run the fit function based on the stack. It's like maybe 30 lines of code, and you run the entire neural network based on this. Um, does anyone have any questions about the code itself? I know it's going to be code on screen. It's always the easiest thing to work. And there's only to get how uh, the get how for this page uh, for these pieces of code at the end of the presentation. And this hasn't even really gotten into deep learning. This hasn't gotten into the nitty gritty stuff, which are the pile of hacks we use to go past uh, gradient descent. But or matching gates. But sitting down and saying functional programming is great for machine learning is one thing. Giving you a case study of another. So let's look at the current neural networks. So as I said, I would go over these very briefly. Um, basically, a current neural network is a neural network with a slight list, literally. Um, Basically, you have the hidden layer that feeds back into itself in a separate way, and it lets you process special data because it has some output from previous iterations. Um, that picture may seem a little bit scary, so we can literally unwrap it, where you define some number of times it runs, and you just keep passing the output along with the next input into the network. And amazingly, these are really, really easy to implement functionally. Um, Encoding is a very common thing that you do with uh, regard neural networks. And basically, you take some variable length input, some, for example, in natural language processing, you take a set of words, and you pass in each one, and you keep passing in the next bit uh, half. The hard thing to express necessarily. Uh, you keep passing the input output to the next bit, uh, iteration. And eventually, you encode your entire string in one value, so you can classify it into various things. A uh, very common thing to do with natural language processing for the first project is like take shape to a and decide whether or not they're a copy or a tragedy based on the data set. In college, I did this based, based on a probability, but you could literally have a class of this based on any such a value. And at the end of the day, all of that is, all it takes to process that is a fold operation. You take some set of values, you keep iterating over them, and passing them into the next iteration. And then you take one value out of the end. That is the definition of fold. And the current neural networks have these all over. Uh, for the text generation, you give it a seed value, and you keep popping up the next thing. That's an old, uh, unfolded right. The entire thing is basically, for what I know in Haskell, is a math accumulation. I don't know an easy parallel for that in Scala. But, Basically, you just keep folding, and that's the entire network. Uh, any questions about that? So, finishing up, um, so credit to give. Yeah, uh, I have a question. Do you have to tell it how many things to fold? Uh, you fold it based off the depth of the current level. So, the fold would just be the length of the other place. So, like in RNN, it was like a return network, right? It doesn't have a depth, it has a, like a length of process. You have a recurrent depth, and as you're generating value, all it is is the length of the list. 
or a number of times that you want to run through. That's why it's unfold versus fold. Unfold, you would be specifying a number of times that you run versus fold, you would just specify a number of times. Anything else? Cool. And this slide is basically still one from someone's blog, and I will get the full credit in a minute because it's really, really nice. Uh, so, finishing up, um, I never really talked about the pitfalls. And the main pitfall is that there's no magic tensor flow for any of the functional libraries right now. Uh, the best thing we have in Scala is uh, deep learning for Java, which isn't even technically Scala, it's all they're working on it for Java. Um, and their support community isn't great, but they do have the advantage of Java docs. Um, so you, it's really easy to look things up online and centralized source. So have you tried? I have, yeah. in fact, tried working with deep learning. Um, I get how there's like the beginning, I have a project that's set on progress, and it's not easy to work with, but it's fairly easy to look up what your problem is. But even this doesn't have an enormous support community, your basically only option for help is going on a group chat, which the developers are fairly active on, but there's no like magic stack code that looks very good to solve your problem. Uh, Haskell is even worse for community. Um, they have, the best thing I found was called Grenade, but it's still in like very early development. They just released O.1.0. Um, but from what I've seen from posts on machine learning reddits and Haskell reddits, um, it looks like it's promising. Um, people are pretty excited from it from these few posts I saw. But those are very few. Um, so is, is there a good like, linear opera library in Haskell? Uh, I don't usually look at Haskell, so I don't know how it's. There's, um, what is it, Kankage? There's, there is some place where they have like a list of all libraries available on the hand and all that. You just, you just look through there and see if you find well, it. Like, in, in order to have a deep learning library, you need a linear algebra library. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Java is a linear algebra library. Yeah, I have, I, basically did a quick Google search for Haskell because I'm not super familiar with the language. So I can't answer that one either. Someone's like, here's my fire helpful. Um, another real quick side thing, no one really uses current neural networks, they're not particularly efficient. That's no SDM. I'm happy to talk to you about them later, but they're kind of a lot of compiled in like two seconds. Uh, and lastly, resources. Um, I didn't really take any like straight college classes that taught me anything about neural networks and deep learning. I took an AI class that gave me like two days worth of material on how to like deep forward it works, and that's about it. Uh, most of what I learned were from various websites, and two of the best I found were this is right here. Uh, Neural Networks and Deep Learning.com is like a six chapter book which will take you from like, understanding what perceptron is to solving uh, the post office and this like handwritten digit data set with kind of the original neural network in six chapters. Uh, Cola at GitHub is where I spill basically all of the recurrent information. They have talks on natural language processing. They have slides on how to SDM works. They have slides on functional programming and current neural networks. It's really amazing. I definitely recommend you with these guys. And otherwise, that's all I've got. Uh, I've got a small side project that I was originally going to base this off of, based off of solving the same MS data that I talked about in Scala from scratch, meaning fully implemented uh, on your Amazon library from scratch, fully implemented unit test from scratch. Basically, a really easy example to look through for any resource you need in how to implement deep learning and scholar. But that's still very much in progress. So far, I've only been with it and you know how it works because I just took a two week vacation. Um, any questions? Awesome. Uh, and a couple sources of hyperlinks because I don't like documenting that at all. <laughs> There's a couple lists on Gage. There's one called Linear and one called HB Trace. Okay. Amen. Thanks.
And I will try and post those slides at uh, the functional question that kind of as soon as I figure out how to post PDF. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to do this tonight. So tonight you're going to have the slides on the meetup page. On the meetup, like the, the event page, and also on, on the other forms. And the videos, I never say that, but I always post the link of the videos on, on the meetup page. How's the quality of the videos? It's extremely bad. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's that webcam, and it just goes and points. Is it, is it colorable? No, it's just that we need to find a way to make it better. You want to zoom in? So we have, there, there's a way, there's this um, there's like very famous gamer in this building, by the way, he gave me like a, the application that the gamer they use. So you can basically can split the screen, you make a video with all the different webcams. So the guy that does our videos for somebody else actually does all of that too, but he's kind of like... Uh, I installed a program on that machine. Yeah. We need to set it up. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's super cool. They do like crazy stuff. You can have multiple webcams and... By the way, yeah. uh, thanks, Brad, for the talk. And is there any announcement like conference or maybe? Some of that. Yeah, um, please. The next one is uh, we just we actually our study group is the Monday right before this. So as long as you always have this this Thursday, it's oh. like the fourth Monday. That's our study group for our Southeastern Michigan JavaScript group. Um, and then we also have a presentation. On the second Monday, which is the next one, is deployed in 60 seconds up and running with the Angular CLI. Okay. And that is August 14th. You say Angular? Yeah, Angular so CLI. All front end, like community, Danielle, yeah. Danielle, yeah. she rocks. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. I'm around. You know. But yeah. Uh -huh. And as always, we try to do the last Thursday of the month, so we'll be at the end of. Oh, no, sorry. No. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> I did the slide like this. Four days, got it. <laughs> so, yeah, in August, please submit talk proposal, otherwise... You're going to talk again? No, I'm going to pick people that... That's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I want to make an announcement, too. I don't know if anyone else is interested in the Elixir or learning about it. We do an Elixir meetup in Detroit. I know it's a long way to drive, but we're on meetup, too. And we're trying to get um, we're trying to get some some of the Elixir big to come and talk to us. Um, so it helps a lot if we have more people there. But if you're interested, just you know. So sorry, you said Alexa. Alexa. Huh? Alexa. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Is there any L aficionados here? We're gonna start a fight or something. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Alexa, I didn't know where is that in Detroit? You said. We're, right now, we're doing it down at the uh, Francis Palm building, which is downtown, like on Woodward, basically almost right across from American Park. So, right right by the Fox. So. And the Fox, the theater. Yeah, yeah. awesome. Okay, nobody's going to kick you out. You can stay here as much as you want. And if you, I can ask you if you can please like, put the, the big like, chairs back in. The square mold. If you bring everything back at the, as it was in the beginning, please drink the beer. The more beer you drink, the less I have to bring it back to work tomorrow, and eat the food. And please feel free and to. <laughs> no, seriously, feel free to stay here and out and have a chat as as long as you want. Okay, thanks you. Thank you for coming, guys. I see you next month. Thank <laughs> you.